Okay, here we go again. Roll Doll and the Min Pins, illustrated by Patrick Benson. Okay, how many of you have read some of Roll Dolls? James and the Giant Peach, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, The Witches. Uh, the BFG, I've done that one already. It's on it's on the website. Matilda, okay. But today I'm gonna to read to you Roald Dahl's The Minpins, illustrated by Patrick Benson. Okay? And this was for Ophelia. I don't know who Ophelia was, but he, she must have been important to Roald Dahl. Little Billy's mother was always telling him exactly what he was allowed to do and what he was not allowed to do. All the things he was allowed to do were boring and all the things he was not allowed to do were exciting. One of the things he was never, never allowed to do the most exciting of them all was to go out through the garden gate all by himself and explore the world beyond. On this sunny summer afternoon, little Billy was kneeling on a chair in the living room, gazing out through the window at the wonderful world beyond. His mother was in the kitchen uh, doing the ironing and although the door was open, she couldn't see him. And every now and again, his mother would call out to him saying, little Billy, what are you up to in there, hmm? And little Billy would always call back and say, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm being good, mommy. But little Billy was awfully tired of being good. Well, through the window, not so very far away, he could see the big black secret wood that was called the Forest of Sin. And it was something he had always longed to explore. His mother, however, had told him that even grown-ups were frightened of going into the forest of sin. And she, she recited a poem to him that was well known in the district. And it went like this. Beware, beware. The forest of sin, none come out, but many go in. Why, 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 why don't they come out? Little Billy asked her. What, what, what happens to them in, in the wood? That wood, his mother said, is full of the most bloodthirsty wild beasts in the world. Well, uh, you mean tigers and lions? Little Billy asked. Oh, much worse than that, his mother said. Well, well what's worse than tigers and lions, mummy? Wang doodles are worse, his mother said, and horn swagglers and snaz wanglers and vermicious canids. And worst of all is the terrible blood suckling, tooth pluckling, stone chuckling spitler. There's one of them in there too. Uh, uh. A, a spitler, mommy? Of course. And when the spitler chases after you, he blows clouds of hot smoke out of his nose. 
would 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 he he eat me up? Little Billy asked. In one gulp, his mother said. Well, little Billy did not believe a word of this. He he guessed his mother was making it all up just to frighten him and to stop him ever going out of the house alone. And now, little Billy, he was kneeling on the chair, gazing with longing through the window at the famous forest of sin. Little Billy, his mother called out from the kitchen, what are you doing? Uh, uh, I'm being good, Mommy. Little Billy called back. But just then, a funny thing happened. Little Billy began to hear somebody whispering into his ear. And he knew exactly who it was. It was the devil. The devil always started whispering to him when he was especially bored. Oh, it would be easy, the devil was whispering, to climb out through that window. No one would see you, and in a jiffy, you would be in the garden and in another jiffy you would be through the forest. No, the front gate. And yet, <coughs> in another jiffy you would be exploring the marvelous forest of sin all by yourself. Oh, it's a super place. Do not believe one word of what your mother says about wang doodles and horn swagglers and snaz wanglers and vermicious canids and the terrible blood suckling, tooth pluckling, stone chuckling spittler. There are no such things. What, what, what is in there? Little Billy whispered. Wild strawberries, the devil whispered back. The whole floor of the forest is carpeted with wild strawberries, every one of them luscious and red and juicy, ripe. Go, go and see for yourself. Well, these were the words the devil whispered softly into little Billy's ear on that sunny summer afternoon. In the next moment, little Billy had opened the window and he was climbing out. And in a jiffy, he had dropped silently onto the flower bed below. And in another jiffy, he was out through the garden gate, and in yet another jiffy, he was standing on the very edge of the great, big, dark forest of sin. He had made it. He had got there, and now the forest was all his to explore. Was, was he nervous? What? Who said anything about being nervous? Horn swagglers, vermicious canids, what sort of rubbish was that? Little Billy hesitated. I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not nervous, he said. I, 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 I'm not in the least bit nervous, not me. Well, very, very slowly he walked toward forward into the great forest. Giant trees were soon surrounding him on all 
both sides and their branches made an almost solid roof high above his head, blotting out the sky. And here and there, little shafts of sunlight shone through gaps in the roof. And there was not any sound anywhere. It was like being among the dead men in an enormous, empty, green cathedral. Well, when he ventured some distance into the forest, little Billy stopped and he stood quite still and he was listening and he could hear nothing. Nothing at all. There was absolute Silence. Or was there? Oh, hold on, just just one second. <coughs> what, what was that? Little Billy flicked his head around and he stared into the everlasting gloom and doom of the forest. Ah, ah, there it was again. There was no mistaking it this time. From far away there came a very faint oozing, whiffling noise like a small gusty wind blowing through the trees. And then it grew louder every second. It was it was growing louder, and, and suddenly it was no longer a small wind. It was a fearsome, swooshing, whooshing, whiffling, snorting noise that sounded as though some gigantic creature was <laughs> breathing heavily through its nose as it as it galloped towards him. Little Billy, he turned and he ran. Little Billy ran faster than he had ever run in his life before, but but the whooshing, swooshing, whiffling, snorting, snorting was coming after him. Worse still, it was getting louder and louder, and this meant that that the the, the thing, the, the, the maker of that noise, the, the, the <laughs> galloping creature was getting closer, and, and it was catching him up. Run, 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 little Billy, run, run, run. And he dodged around massive trees, and he skipped over roots and brambles, and he bent low to flash under boughs and bushes, and he, and he had wings on his feet. He ran so fast, but still the fearsome swooshing, whooshing, whiffling, snorting <laughs> noise grew louder and louder, and it was it came closer and closer, and little Billy glanced back quickly over his shoulder, and now, in the distance, he saw a sight that froze his blood and made icicles in his veins. Ah, ah, and what he saw were two mighty puffs of orange-red smoke billowing and rolling through the trees in his direction, and they were they were followed by two more whoosh, 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 and then and then two more whoosh, whoosh. And, and they, they most surely, they must surely be coming, little Billy told himself from, from the two nose holes of some galloping, panting <laughs> beast that, that had smelled him out and, and was coming after him. And his mother's, his mother's words began uh, thrumming once again inside his head. Beware, beware the forest of sin. None come out, but many go in. It's the spittler for sure, little Billy cried out. Mummy, mummy said the spittler blows smoke when it chases you. And this one is, he's blowing smoke. It's the its the terrible blood-suckling, tooth-plucking, stone-chuckling spittler. Ah! And soon, soon it will catch 
catch me up and, and I'll, I'll be blood suckled and, and tooth pluckled and, and stone chuckled and, and chewed up into tiny pieces and then and then the spittler will spit me out in a cloud of smoke and that will be the end of me little billy he was running with the speed of an arrow but each time he glanced back over his shoulders the puffs of orange and red smoky breath had gotten closer and they were so close now that he could feel the wind of them on the back of his neck and the the noise it was it was deafening in his ears this fearsome swooshing whooshing whiffling panting ha, 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 boom, boom. Ha, ha, it went and it was like it was like the noise made by a steam locomotive pulling out of the a train station and then suddenly suddenly he heard another noise that was somehow more fearsome still it was the pounding of gigantic galloping hooves on the floor of the forest and he glanced round again but the thing the beast the the monster or or whatever it was was hidden from his sight by by the smoke it shot out of its as it galloped forward the smoky breath was billowing all around him now and he could feel its its hotness and worse still he could smell its its smell the smell was disgusting it was the stench that comes from deep inside the the tummy of a meat eating animal mommy he cried out save me <laughs> saw the trunk of an enormous tree and this tree was very was different from the others because it it had branches hanging down very low while while still running he made a frantic jump for its lowest branch and he caught it and he pulled himself up and then he grabbed the next branch above his head and he pulled himself up again and again and then again and he was climbing higher and higher to get to get away from the the terrible snorting the the smoke blowing breath, smelly breath beast that was down below and he stopped he stopped climbing Climbing, only when he was too exhausted to climb any higher and he looked up <sighs> but even now he couldn't see the top of this giant tree it seemed to go on forever and he looked down and he couldn't see the ground either he was he was in a world of green leaves and thick smooth branches with no earth or sky in sight. The snorting, smelly, smoke-blowing beast was, was miles ahead, miles away now, down, down below somewhere, and he couldn't, he couldn't even hear it anymore. Well, little, little Billy, he found a, a comfortable place where, where two big branches came together and he, he sat down to rest. And for the moment, at any rate, he, he was safe. And then something very peculiar happened. There, there was a huge, smooth branch very close to where Billy little Billy was sitting and he suddenly he noticed that a small square patch of bark on this branch was beginning to move. It was a very small patch about the size of a postage stamp and the two sides of it seemed to be splitting down the middle and opening slowly outwards like a pair of, of, of shutters on some tiny window. Little Billy sat staring at this extraordinary thing and, and all at once a strange
strange, uncomfortable feeling came over him. It felt as though the tree he was sitting in and the green leaves all around him belonged to another world altogether. And that he, he was a, a trespasser who had no right to be where he was. And he watched intently as the tiny shutters of the tree bark opened wider and wider. And when they were fully open, they revealed a small squarish window set neatly in the curve of the big branch where there was there was some sort of a yellowish glow coming from deep inside the window and the very next thing little Billy saw was a tiny face at the window. It, it had appeared suddenly from, from nowhere, and it was the face of an extremely old man with white hair. And little Billy, he could see this clearly, despite the fact that the whole of the tiny man's head was no larger than a pea. This ancient, miniature face was staring at little Billy with the most severe expression on it. And the skin on the face was deeply wrinkled all over, but the eyes were as bright as two stars. Now, something even more peculiar began to happen all around him, not only on the huge main trunk of the tree, but also on all the big branches that grew out of it. Other tiny windows were opening and tiny faces were peering out. Some of these faces belonged to men and others were clearly women. Here and there, the head of a child was seen peering over a windowsill. Now the heads of these children were no larger than the heads of matchsticks. In the end, there must have been more than 20 small windows all around where little Billy was sitting. And from each window, these amazing little faces were peering out. No sound came from any of the watchers. The faces were silent, unmoving, almost ghostly. Now the tiny old man in the window nearest to Billy, he seemed to be saying something, but his voice was so soft and whispery. Little Billy had to lean right up close to catch his words. You're in a bit of a twizzler, aren't you? The voice was saying. You can't go down and again. Uh, because if you do, you'll be gustled up at once by... Uh, but, you, but you can't possibly sit up here for ever either. I know, I know, little Billy gasped. Don't, don't shout, the tiny man said. I'm, well, I'm, I, I'm not shouting, little Billy said. Talk softer, the tiny man said, if you talk too loud, your voice will blow me away. But, but, but who are you? Little Billy asked, taking care to speak very softly this time. We are the Midpins, the tiny man said, and we 
own this wood. I shall come closer, and then you will be able to hear me better. Well, the old men pen climbed out of his window, and he walked straight down the big, steeply sloping branch, then up another branch until he found a place only a few inches from little Billy's face. Oh, it was amazing to see him walking up and down these almost vertical branches with the slightest, without the slightest trouble. It was like seeing someone walking up and down a wall. Well, uh, how on earth do you do that? Little Billy asked. Oh, suction boots, the men pit said. We all wear them. You can't live in trees without suction boots. And on his feet he was wearing tiny green boots, rather like miniature wellies. And his clothes were curiously old-fashioned, mostly brown and black, the, the sort of thing people wore two or three hundred years ago. Suddenly, all the other minpins, men, women, and children, they were all climbing out of their windows, and they were making their ways towards little Billy. Now, their suction boots seemed to... to allow them to walk up and down the branches with the greatest ease, and some were even walking upside down underneath the branches. All of them were wearing these old-fashioned clothes from hundreds of years ago, and several had on very peculiar hats and bonnets. Well, they stood, or they sat, in groups on all the branches around little Billy, staring at him as though he were someone from outer space. Well, but, but, but do all of you actually live inside this tree? Little Billy asked, and the old minpin said, Oh, all of the trees in this forest are hollow. Not, not just one, but all of them. And inside them, thousands and thousands of minpins are living. And these, well, these great trees are filled with rooms and staircases. J that Not just the big main trunk, but most of the other branches as well. And this, this is a minpin forest. And it's not the only one in England. Okay. Could I peep inside? Little Billy said. Well, of course, of course, the old minpin said. Put, put your eye close to that window. And he pointed to the one he had just come out of. Little Billy shifted his position, and he placed one eye right up against the square hole that was no bigger than a postage stamp. Now. What he now saw was quite marvelous. He saw a room that was lit by a pale yellow light of some sort, and it was furnished with beautifully made miniature chairs and a table. And to one side was a four-poster bed. It was like one of the rooms little Billy had seen in the Queen's dollhouse at Windsor Castle. Oh, it's beautiful, little Billy said. Uh, are they all as lovely as this one? Well, most are smaller, the old minpin said. This one is very grand because I, I am the ruler of this tree. My name is Don Minnie. What is yours? Mine is little Billy, little Billy said. Well, greetings, little Billy, Don Minnie said. You are welcome to look into some of the other rooms, if you wish. We are very proud of them. Ah, all the Minpins families wanted to show little Billy their, their own rooms, and they rushed about along the branches, calling out, Come, come, come see mine. Please, oh, oh, please come see mine. Little Billy began climbing about and, and peeping into 
the tiny windows. Through one window, he saw a bathroom just like his own at home, only a thousand times smaller. And although, uh, and then through another one, he saw a classroom with lots of tiny desks and, and a blackboard at one end. In every room, there was a stairway in one corner leading up to the the room above. And as little Billy went from window to window, the minpins followed him, clustering around and smiling at his exclamations of wonder. Oh, they're, they're all absolutely marvelous, he said. They're much nicer than our rooms at, at home. Well, when the sightseeing tour was over, little Billy sat down again on a large branch, and he said to the whole company of minpins, Look, I've had a lovely time with you all, but how am I ever going to get home again? My my mother is, is, is she'll be going crazy. Oh, you never, you'll never, you can never get down from this tree, Don Minnie said. I've I told you that if you're a stupid enough to try, you'll be eaten up in five seconds. Is, is it the spitler? Little Billy asked. Is it the, the terrible, uh, blood suckling, tooth pluckling, stone chuckling spitler? Oh, I, I've, I've never heard of any spitler, Don Minnie said. The one waiting for you down there is the fearsome gruncher, the red-hot smoke-belching gruncher, and he grunches up everything in the forest, and that's why we have to live up here. He has grunched up hundreds of humans and literally millions of minpins. And what makes him so dangerous is his amazing and magical nose. His nose can smell out a human or, or a minpin or any other animal five, ten miles away. And then he gallops towards it at terrific speed. He can never see anything in front of him because of all the smoke he belches out from his nose and his mouth, but that doesn't bother him. His nose tells him exactly where to go. Well, why does the, he blow all that smoke, out all that smoke? Little Billy asked. Well, because he's got a red hot fire in his belly, Don Minnie said. The gruncher likes his meat roasted, and the fire roasts it as it goes down. Uh, oh, well, look, little Billy said, gruncher or no gruncher, I've uh, simply got to get home. Somehow I'll, I'll have to make a, a dash for it. Oh, I do, don't try it, I beg you, Don Minnie said. The gruncher knows you're up here. He He's down there now waiting for you. Climb down a bit lower with me and, and what I'll show you. Don Minnie walked easily straight down the side of the great tree trunk and little Billy climbed carefully down after him from one branch to the next. Soon below them they began to smell the revolting hot stench of, of the cruncher's breath, and the orange-red smoke was now billowing up into the lower branches in thick clouds. Oh, what, what does he look like? Little Billy whispered. Nobody knows, Don Minnie answered. He makes so much steam uh, and smoke, you, you can never see him. If you are behind him, you can sometimes uh, catch a glimpse of little bits of him because of all the smoke is being blown out in, in the front. Uh, some 
Pinpin say they have seen his back legs, huge and black and very hairy, shaped like lion's Ooh. legs, but ten times as big. And it is rumored that his head is like an enormous crocodile's head with rows and rows and rows of sharp pointed teeth but nobody nobody really knows mind you he he must have a gigantic nose holes to be able to blow out that smoke well they stayed still listening and they could hear the cruncher pawing the ground and <coughs> giant hooves and snorting with, with greed. <coughs> he smells you, Don Minnie said. He knows you aren't far away. He'll wait for you. He'll wait forever to get you now. He adores humans and he doesn't catch them very often. Humans are like strawberries and cream to him. You see, for months he's been living on a diet of minpins, and a thousand minpins is not even a snack for him. The brute, he is ravenous. Well, little Billy and Don Minnie climbed back up the tree to where all the other minpins were gathered, and they, they seemed glad to see little Billy come safely back. Oh, oh, stay up here with us, they said to him. We'll, we'll look after you. Just then, a lovely blue swallow alighted on a branch not far away, and little Billy saw a mother minpin and her two children climb quite casually onto the swallow's back. And then the swallow took off and flew away with its passengers, seated comfortably between its wings. Good heavens, little Billy cried. Is, is that a special tame bird? Oh, not at all, Don Minnie said. We, we know all the birds. The birds are our friends, and we use them all the time for, for going places. That lady is taking her children to see their grandmother, who lives in another forest about 50 miles away. And they'll be there in less than an hour. Well, can, can you talk to them? Little Billy asked. What, yeah, to the birds, I mean? Well, of course we can talk to them, Don Minnie said. We can summon them any time we want. If we have to go somewhere, how else would we get our supplies of food up here? That red-hot gruncher makes it impossible for us to walk anywhere in the wood. Well, do the birds like doing this for you? Little Billy asked. Oh, they'll do anything for us, Don Minnie said. They love us, and we love them, and we store food for them inside the trees so they don't starve when the icy cold winter comes along. Suddenly all sorts of birds were alighting on the branches of the tree around where little Billy was sitting. And the min pins were climbing onto their backs in droves. And most of the min pins had small sacks slung over their shoulders. At this time of the day, they go off to collect food, Don Minnie said. All the grown-ups have to help in getting food for the community. Uh, the population of each tree looks after itself. Our large trees are like your uh, cities and towns, and the small trees are like your uh, villages. It was astonishing. It was an astonishing sight. Every kind of wonderful bird was flying in and perching on the branches of the great tree. And as soon as one landed, a minpin would climb onto its back and off they would go. There were blackbirds and thrushes and skylarks 
and the ravens and, and starlings and jays and magpies and many kinds of small finches. It was all very fast and well organized. Each bird seemed to know exactly which minpin it was collecting. And each minpin knew exactly which bird he or she had ordered for the morning. Oh, now, the, the, the birds are our cars, Don Minnie said to little Billy. They are much nicer, and they, and they never crash. Soon, all the grown-up minpins, excepting Don Minnie, had flown away on birds, and only the tiny children were left. And then the robins came in, and the children began climbing onto the backs, their backs, and going for short flights. And then Don Minnie said to little Billy, Oh, the children all practice learning to fly on robins. Robins are sensible and careful birds, and they love the little ones. Little Billy simply stood there, staring. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. Oh, look at all those birds, huh? All the different people. They're all going here and going there. Yep. While the children were practicing on the robins, little Billy said to Don Minnie, is, is there no way in the world to get rid of that uh, disgusting, red-hot, uh, smoke-belching gruncher down, down below? Oh, the only time a gruncher dies, Don Minnie said, is if he falls into deep water. The water puts out the fire inside of him, and then eh, he's dead. Well, the fire, the, the fire to the gruncher is like your heart's, or your heart is to you. You, you stop your heart, and what, you, you die at once. Put out that fire in the gruncher, and he dies in five seconds. It's the only way to kill a gruncher. No, no, <clears throat> now ha hang on a minute, little Billy said. Is, is there by chance a, a pond or, or something uh, like that around here? Oh, well, there is a, <coughs> a big lake on the far side of the forest, Don Minnie said. But who's going to entice the gruncher into that? Not us. And certainly not you. He'd, he'd be on you before you got within ten yards of him. But you did say the gruncher can't see in front of him because of all the clouds of smoke he blows, little Billy said. Oh, that's quite true, Don Minnie said. But how is that going to help us? I, I don't think the gruncher's ever uh, going to fall into the lake. He, he never goes out of the forest. Well, I think, I think I know how to make him fall in, little Billy said. What, what I want, <coughs> little Billy went on, I want a bird that is big enough to, to carry me. Don Minnie thought for this, thought about this for a while, and then he said, well, you're, you're a very small boy because of that. I think a swan uh, could, could carry you quite easily. Well, uh, call up a swan, little Billy said. And suddenly there was a new authority in his voice. Oh, but, but uh, I hope you're not uh, going to do anything uh, dangerous, Don Minnie cried. Listen carefully little Billy said, because you must tell the swan exactly what he has to do. With me on his back, he must fly down to the gruncher, and the gruncher will smell me and know that I am very close, but he won't see me through the steam and the smoke, and he'll go mad trying to get at me. Well, the swan will tantalize him by flying back and forth right in front of him. Is, is that possible? Oh, yeah, quite possible, Don Minnie said. 
except that you you might easily fall off. You you've had no flying practice at all. Well, I'll hang on somehow, little Billy said, and then the swan, keeping very low, will fly off through the forest with the ravenous gruncher, Hotfoot, in pursuit. And the swan will keep just ahead of the gruncher all the time, driving him crazy with my smell. And in the end, the swan will fly straight over the big deep lake. And the gruncher, now traveling at a terrific speed, will follow right behind. Presto, he's in the lake. Oh, oh my boy, Don Minnie cried. You are a genius. Well, will you do it? Call up the swan, little Billy ordered. Don Minnie turned to one of the robins, which had just come back from a practice flight with a child, Minpin, on his back. And little Billy heard him talking to the robin in a kind of curious twitter. He couldn't understand a word of it. And the robin nodded its head and he flew off. Two minutes later, a truly magnificent swan, as white as snow, came swooping in and landed on a branch nearby. And Don Minnie walked over to it, and once again, a curious, twittery conversation took place, much longer this time, with Don Minnie doing all the twittering, and the swan nodding and nodding. Then Don Minnie turned to little Billy, and he said, Swan thinks it's a great idea. He says he can do it, but he's just a bit nervous because you, you have never flown before. And he says you must hang on very tight to his feathers. Oh, well, don't, don't you worry about that, little Billy said. I'll hang on somehow. I don't want to be roasted alive and eaten by a, by the gruncher. Little Billy climbed onto the swan's back. And many of the minpins who had flown away a short while ago were, were now returning on their birds. Their tiny sacks were bulging. They stood around on the branches, staring in wonder at the sight of this small human preparing to take off on Swan. Oh, goodbye, little Billy, they called out. Oh, good luck, good luck. And, and with that, the great swan spread its wings and glided gently down through the branches of the tree. Little Billy hung on tight. Oh, it was thrilling to be flying out on the back of this great swan. It was wonderful to be up in the air and to feel the air swishing past his face. And he hung on very tightly to swan's feathers. And then suddenly, there it was, just below them. The huge billow of orange-red smoke and steam coming from the nostrils of the awesome gruncher. And the smoke enveloped the beast completely. And yet, through the smoke, as they got very close, little Billy could just make out the enormous black shadow of some hairy monster and the snorting grew louder <laughs> and as the, the brute got more and more excited by the nearness of the delicious little billy smell the smoke began coming out faster and faster and little billy could feel the monster getting closer and closer and the swan was flying back and forth in front of the smoke, tempting and tantalizing the beast and driving him mad with greed. 
and the beast, or or rather the cloud of smoke, kept lunging at little Billy, but the swan was too quick for him and jinked away every time. The, the snorting grew louder and louder and, the, and more ferocious every second, and the whoomp, 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 of thick hot steam came pouring out thicker than ever. Once, Swan looked to see, round to see if Billy, little Billy was all right. And little Billy nodded and he smiled and he could swear that Swan nodded and smiled back at him. At last, Swan must have decided they had had enough teasing and the great thick orange red cloud was leaping up and down in a frenzy of, of hunger and desire and the whole forest was echoing with the snorts and growls of this awesome creature. And Swan glided around, headed in a straight towards the edge of the forest. And of course, the vast cloud of smoke came hurtling after it. Swan was very careful to fly low at all time, all the time, and he keeping just in front of the cruncher, <coughs> leading him on and on, threading a path carefully through the great trees in the forest, and the scent of human food was very strong in the cruncher's nostrils, and he must have been thinking that so long as he kept going flat out, he would catch his meal in the end. them on the edge of the forest was the lake and the cruncher hurtling along right behind them was interested only in the glorious human scent swan flew straight towards the lake and skimmed low over the water and the cruncher the cruncher kept going little billy looking back saw the cruncher plunging right into the lake and then the whole lake seemed to erupt in a mass of boiling, steaming, frothing, bubbling water. <laughs> For a brief moment, the terrible, red-hot, smoking, smoke-belching cruncher made the lake boil and smoke like a volcano, and then... The fire went out, and the awesome beast disappeared under the waves. Well, when it was all over, Swan and Little Billy flew higher and circled the lake for a last look. And suddenly, the whole sky around them was filled with birds, and every bird, on every bird, they had one or more minpins on its back. And little Billy recognized Don Minnie riding a fine jay. And he was waving and cheering as he flew alongside them. It seemed that all the other minpins from the big tree had turned up as well to witness the great victory over the dreaded gruncher. Every kind of bird was circling around little Billy and Swan and the minpins on their backs were waving and, and clapping and shouting with joy. And little Billy waved back and he laughed and he, he thought how wonderful it was. Then, led by Swan, all the birds and the minpins returned to the home tree. Now back in the tree there were tremendous there was a tremendous celebration for little Billy's victory over the dreaded gruncher. Minpins from all over the forest had flown in on their birds to cheer the, the young hero. And all the branches and twigs of the great tree were crowded with tiny people. And when the cheers and the clapping had finally died down at last, Don Minnie stood up 
to make a speech. Minpins of the forest, he cried, raising his small voice so that it could be heard all over the tree. The murderous scruncher, who has gobbled up so many thousands of minpins, has gone forever. The forest floor is safe at last for us to walk on. So now we can all go down to pick blackberries and winkleberries and puckleberries and muckleberries and twinkleberries and snozberries to our heart's content. And our children can play among the wildflowers and the roots all day long. Well, Don Minnie paused, and he turned his eyes upon little Billy, who was sitting on a branch not far away. But, ladies and gentlemen, he went on, who is it we have to thank for this great blessing that has come upon us? Who is the savior of the minpins? Don Minnie paused again, and the minpins in their thousands sat listening intently. Our savior, he cried out, our hero, our wonder boy is, as you already know, our human visitor, little Billy. And there were cheers and shouts of hooray, hooray for little Billy. <laughs> Yay! Well, Don Minnie turned and spoke directly to little Billy. You, my boy, have done a wonderful thing, and in return we wish to do something for you. I have had a word with Swan, and he has agreed to become your personal private aerial plane for just as long as you remain small enough to fly on his back. There were more cheers. Yay! Oh, yes. Oh, good old swan. Yes, yes. What a great idea. However, Don Minnie continued, still, still addressing little Billy, you uh, cannot go flying around all over the place on Swan's back in, in full daylight. Some human would be bound uh, to see you, and then the secret would be out, and you would be forced to tell your people all about us. And that, little Billy, must never happen if it did crowds of enormous humans would come clumping all over our uh, beloved forest to look for minpins, and our quiet homeland would be ruined. Oh, I, 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 I'll never tell a soul, little Billy cried out. What well, even so, Don Minnie said, we cannot risk you making a daylight flights. But every night, after the light in your bedroom has been switched off, Swan will come to your window to see if you'd like a ride. And sometimes he will bring you back here to see us. Other times he may, he will he take you to visit places more wonderful than you uh, could ever dream of. Would, would you like Swan uh, to take you home now? I think we can risk your just one more flight, uh, one more quick daylight flight. Oh, oh gosh, little Billy cried. I, I, I'd clean forgotten about my home. Uh, Mommy will be in a panic. Uh, I must fly. Don Minnie gave a signal and in five seconds, Swan swooped down and landed on the tree. 
Little Billy climbed on his back, and as the great swan spread his wings and flew away, the whole forest, not not just the, the tree they were, were in, but the whole forest from end to end came alive with the cheering of a million minpins. Well, Swan landed on the lawn of Little Billy's house, and Little Billy jumped off his back and ran to the living room window, and very quietly he climbed in. The room was empty. Little Billy, came his mother voice, mother's voice from the kitchen. What are you up to in there? You've been quiet for a long time. I'm being good, Mommy, little Billy called back. I'm being very, very good. Well, his mother came into the room with a pile of ironing in her arms, and she looked at little Billy. Oh, what have you been doing? She cried. Your clothes are absolutely filthy. Well, I've been climbing trees, little Billy said. Oh, I can't let you out of my sight for ten minutes, his mother said. Which, which tree was it? Well, it's just one of those old trees outside, little Billy said. Well, if you're not careful, you'll fall down and you'll break an arm, his mother said. Don't do it again. I won't, little Billy said, smiling a little. I'll just fly up into the branches on silver wings. Oh, what rubbish you talk, his mother said, and she walked out of the room with her ironing. Well, from then on, a swan came every night so to little Billy's bedroom window, and he came after Billy's mother and father had gone to sleep, and the whole house was quiet. But little Billy was never asleep. He was always wide awake and eagerly waiting, and every night before Swan arrived, he saw to it that the curtains were drawn back and the window was wide open so that the great bird could come gliding right into his room and land on the floor beside his bed. And then little Billy would slip into his dressing gown and he would climb onto Swan's back and off they would go. Oh, oh, it was a wondrous secret life that little Billy lived up there in the sky at night on Swan's back. They flew in a magical world of silence, swooping and gliding over the dark world below where all the earthly people were fast asleep in their beds. Once, Swan flew higher than ever before, and they came to an enormous billowing cloud that was shining in a pale golden light. And in the folds of this cloud, little Billy could, could make out the creatures of some sort moving around. Who were they? He wanted so badly to ask Swan this question, but he couldn't speak a word of bird language. Swan seemed unwilling to fly very close to these creatures from another world, and, and this made it impossible for little Billy to see them clearly. Well, another time Swan flew through the night for what seemed like hours and hours until they came at last to a gigantic opening in the Earth's surface, a sort of huge gaping hole in the ground. And Swan glided slowly round and round above this massive crater and then right down into it, deeper and deeper they went into the dark hole. And suddenly there was brightness the brightness like sunlight below them, and little Billy could see a vast lake of water, gloriously blue, and on the surface of the, the lake, thousands of swans were swimming slowly about. The pure white of the swans against the blue of the water was very beautiful.
And that's it. The end of Roald Dahl, The Minpins, illustrated by Patrick Benson. Okay, those cloud people, they're going to be in another one of uh, Roald Dahl's stories. Maybe, maybe you've already read it or saw the movie. It had to do with a peach. Okay, see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>